Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we're going to be talking about Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and the clash over progressivism that took America to the end of the fourth party system. In the last episode, we talked about how the Republican Party and the fourth party system had now emerged as a new progressive party. It was a party that had identified with the progressive movement. It had pushed forward progressive causes under progressive leaders like Teddy Roosevelt. So what about Woodrow Wilson? Like Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. And wasn't he a progressive? Wasn't he one of the key progressive leaders in the era before the New Deal? And what about the election of 1912? It was an election, it was a three-way race between William Howard Taft, the Republican, Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, and a third party candidate, the third party of the Progressive Party, headed by none other than former Republican President Teddy Roosevelt. A race in which all three candidates had a claim on identifying as a progressive. Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna be talking about Roosevelt and Wilson and their ideologies and this fight over progressivism that kind of brought an end to the true great debate of the era of the fourth party system. So Teddy Roosevelt by 1908 has served out his two terms. He uh, finished the end of the term of William McKinley who had been uh, assassinated in office. Roosevelt, his vice president, had assumed the presidency and now he's served in addition a term of his own. And he's done it as a progressive policy champion. He is aligned with the progressive movement. He's tried to push forward progressive policy ideas. And over the course of his presidency, he's gotten more and more impassioned. He's gotten more aggressive, wanted to push further to the point where many people in his party are now even starting to get concerned that he's pushing too far and too fast. So now, after two terms, Teddy Roosevelt has to retire because he's reached two terms. Now, he didn't have to retire under the law, not under the Constitution which hadn't yet been amended to make the two terms mandatory. It was still just sort of uh, expected. And it was because of the presidency of George Washington. George Washington had retired after two terms as president, and he did it intentionally. He did it to signal that the presidency was not a job for life. The president was not a king. It was a temporary job. You would come in and serve. And then when your term was done, you'd go back home and once again become an ordinary citizen. And in honor of that precedent, every president since had felt like after two terms, they had to retire too. Because if it was good enough for George Washington, it was certainly good enough for them. So Teddy Roosevelt, at the end of his second term, he feels the same pressure that he can't run for a third, even though he really doesn't want to leave. So what he does is he looks through his advisors and his lieutenants and his friends, and he tries to find somebody who he thinks is going to carry on his legacy, who feels the same way about policy that he does, as well as hopefully somebody who he can whisper in their ear, somebody he trusts and who will be open to him from the outside, continuing to influence the country to keep pushing it on, on the course that Roosevelt wants to see it go. And he decides on William Howard Taft. Taft is the Secretary of War. He's been one of Roosevelt's close lieutenants and a close advisor. And Roosevelt trusts him. And he thinks, this is a guy who sees the world just like I do. And he's also a guy who I think is gonna listen to me, that when I leave office, I can keep talking to him and making sure that he keeps the country on the proper path. So given Roosevelt's influence in the party and great stature at the time, he basically is able to pick Taft out and hand him the Republican nomination. And the party goes along with Roosevelt's choice and Taft gets nominated and he runs in an election against William Jennings Bryan and he wins and he becomes the president at which point it's Teddy Roosevelt's time to retire off into the sun. The problem with Taft is he wasn't really a politician. He didn't even really want to be president. He kind of got pushed into it. Taft, he was more cerebral. He was a thinker and a writer and a reader. And the job, his dream job was to be a judge. Particularly, he really wanted to be on the Supreme Court. So the presidency wasn't the kind of thing he wanted to do. Where Roosevelt, he liked getting in the mix. He liked fighting. He liked pushing forward, pushing new ideas. Taft liked to sit and think 
and work with people and compromise. So Taft is already not inclined to push the progressive agenda nearly as aggressively as Roosevelt would have done, which is frustrating to Roosevelt. Taft also, he's more of a compromiser. So he wants to work together with the different factions of his party and kind of find a middle road, a middle ground that everybody's happy with, which again means not pushing as far as hard as Roosevelt would have done. And in addition though, it turns out he's more of his own man than Roosevelt thought, because once he's president, he's not just gonna take directions from Teddy Roosevelt. He's gonna govern based on his own judgment on what he thinks is right. So Roosevelt now had to spend four years out of office and in, in a number of incidents, Taft disappointed him. He didn't do what he wanted. He felt like Taft was backing off on his legacy, was, was doing a counter-revolution almost, uh, had been captured by his opponents to undo all the good that Roosevelt had sought to do. So after four years of sitting back and watching, Roosevelt had had enough. And in 1912, he decides he's gonna run for president again himself because the tradition was still a little bit open. See, after Washington, everybody knew you couldn't do two terms, but it wasn't clear whether that meant only two terms in a row or two terms total. So as Roosevelt saw it, he had done his two terms, he sat out for four years, now it was perfectly appropriate for him to come back, and there was nobody really to tell him that he couldn't. So 1912, Teddy Roosevelt decides he's gonna run again for president, and he's gonna once again seek the Republican nomination. So. He comes into the Republican National Convention and naturally he splits the party because there are some people that are happy to see Teddy's return. He's been a very successful president. He's sort of a popular president of their party. He's a progressive champion with people with progressive views are happy to see come back. But there are plenty of other people who find this whole thing quite alienating. I mean, Taft is now the president. He's been president. He's done a decent job. There's nothing he's done that they think uh, merits him not getting renominated, and they're not really happy to see Teddy muscling his way back in. He's already had his two terms. Now he's back, he's gonna be energetic and disruptive, and they're not really happy to see Teddy Roosevelt muscle Taft back off the stage. So the party splits in half. And some go with Roosevelt, and others go with Taft, and Taft ends up winning renomination. Teddy Roosevelt, not happy with the answer, decides, forget that, he's gonna run as a third party candidate. And he forms a new party called the Progressive Party with a stronger progressive agenda, a, an agenda stronger than even when he was president himself. And the Republican Party is splintered and we have two Republican candidates for president, one the Republican Taft, and now a third party progressive candidate, the former president, Teddy Roosevelt. The Democrats that year nominate Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, who had kind of come out of nowhere, Two years before, he had find, he'd, he'd launched his political career as governor of New Jersey. He had been a professor and the president of Princeton University. And so he ran for governor of New Jersey, and the local Democratic political machine uh, was happy to, to get him in the office, expecting he would be somebody who was kind of naive and that they could control, and were very much disappointed. Because Wilson was a strong-minded guy, and he came in, and then he went to war against the machine, and it rose him to national prominence. And when he launched his political career in New Jersey, he did it again as a progressive. He announced himself as a progressive and identified with the progressive movement. And so now he's running for president as a progressive. So now there are three candidates in the race and they're all conceivably a progressive. There's the Republican who used to be a progressive, the progressive candidate who's definitely a progressive and the Democrat who now is also a progressive too. So what does this mean? The fourth party system was now reaching the near of its end because there was nothing left to debate. The progressive movement is now so powerful and so popular that everybody wants to jump on board. The great debate that started in 1896 is effectively over. The question is no longer if, it's how. And these three candidates, of course, have very different ideas on the how, which turn out to be very important. Roosevelt, He's running on a, uh, an agenda he calls the new nationalism. And the new nationalism is based around this idea. It is that we've now learned that bigness is part of the economy. There's these growing businesses and there's gonna be more consolidation. And so we have to accept that bigness is a part of the future. And in fact, bigness is good because it's, it's very efficient. It's an efficient way to run things, but it needs supervision. 
So we're going to have government, a strong government with a lot of regulation looking over and supervising large businesses and institutions in America. And through that, the government is going to be an activist element that's going to push forward reform. He wants a, max, a, a limit of an eight-hour uh, workday. He wants a minimum wage for women. He wants a new national health service. He wants an inheritance tax. Uh, he wants uh, a new uh, pensions, a, a social s security type system for old age and for disability. He has a bunch of sort of groundbreaking ideas that he's going to take the progressive agenda further. And they're all based on the idea of a government that has a responsibility to ensure prosperity and justice, and that the government will supervise over the economy and intervene to make sure, going back to the ideas of the square deal, that there is change the rules so that there's fair play and equal opportunity and fair reward for success. Wilson's view is the opposite. He thinks bigness is bad. He thinks that big business, big institutions, big government, all of it's bad. The Democrats had always hated bigness. They hated bigness in government. They hated bigness in business. They were the Jeffersonian party of limited government and states' rights. And in fact, it turns out that's Wilson's background too. Because before he was governor of New Jersey, Wilson was a Bourbon Democrat. And the Bourbons was the, were the faction of the Democratic Party that had ruled after the Civil War and continued to have a lot of influence after the emergence of the fourth party system in Bryan sort of the remnants of the old Southern aristocracy, the pro-business, uh, but the business of agriculture wing that were for states' rights and small government. And that is what Wilson had in his politics believed before he had relaunched his career two years before as a progressive. Also remember, Wilson's a Southerner and he's steeped in this sort of Jeffersonian tradition. He's governor of New Jersey because he's president of Princeton University, but he's a Virginian and that he has that political legacy with him. He wants to take those ideas and find a way to achieve the progressive movement's goals, but not through the progressive ideology, the ideology, ideology of new nationalism of Teddy Roosevelt. He wants to create a new version of effectively small government progressivism. This idea he calls the new freedom it's crafted greatly by Louis Brandeis, who is sort of one of his intellectual advisors, who later becomes a Supreme Court justice when Wilson becomes president. And under the new freedom, we're gonna, it, the idea is to, to, instead of having a government that supervises big companies and big industries and a big government, we're gonna do the opposite. What the government should do is this. It should look for inefficiencies and evils and wrongs in the economy. He looked for concentrations of power and intervened selectively to break it up. And by removing those things, allow things to trickle up from the market and lead to good outcomes. And that the solution wasn't big companies being managed by big government, which is what he thought uh, Roosevelt was suggesting. It was the exact opposite. Limited government, limited small companies. The solution to Wilson is the exact opposite of the solution of Roosevelt. It's to eliminate, not just increase the power of government, but the opposite, to keep government small, to keep this idea of states' rights, and just to break up concentrations of industry wherever you find a problem, and then allow the market to take care of everything itself. A philosophy which, mind you, doesn't sound very progressive. It sounds like bourbon Democrats. The intellectual tradition from which Wilson had come from. But in this three-way race, we have this competition over the idea of progressivism between new nationalism and new freedom, and the Republican Party is shattered because it's now been broken into two, and the splintering of the Republican Party allows the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, to come in and get a victory, and he becomes the second Democrat since the Civil War to become president, and the first one in the entirety of the Fourth Party system, the first and only. Wilson is president, uh, endorses a lot of progressive ideas. He uh, reaches arrangements with a lot of progressive leaders who come to support him. And uh, a, a lot of the biggest progressive uh, 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 policies that were implemented actually happened on Wilson's watch. So a lot of the progressive movement's reforms that Teddy Roosevelt had been fighting for, they happened eventually under Wilson. Now, that said, 
Wilson also often dragged his feet and had to get forced to do it, and the progressive movement activist had to put his feet to the fire and make him act. But at the end of the day, he did. So if what you mean by progressive is a set of policy solutions, then by those terms, Wilson and his faction of the Democratic Party certainly look progressive. But also, there's a lot of things about Wilson that don't seem very progressive in either their outcome or their philosophy. There's the whole small government thing, which doesn't sound very progressive. There's also the fact of, uh, you know, Wilson, as modern progressives look at him and object that uh, he had horrible views on race, not just by our current definition, but uh, by the definition of the times. His racial attitudes are horrific. He uh, was the first president to uh, segregate the federal government since the Civil War, 50 years since the Civil War, and he's the guy that put segregation in the government. He's also the guy who his administration harassed and tried to push out African Americans from government service. You know, people, it was the Republican Party since the Civil War had been putting African Americans in federal service, and when Wilson was president, he did whatever he could to try to push him out. He's the guy who uh, uh, put the racist movie Birth of a Nation and aired it in the White House. And in addition to all that, there's other things he did. He's the guy who uh, used his power in World War I to throw critics in prison under the idea of national security, uh, including Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate for president who had angered Wilson, and he threw him in prison. He got him prosecuted for sedition for during the war, uh, putting out the idea that people should resist the draft. He's progressive in outcome, but he wasn't progressive at all really in philosophy. He was something else. He was really philosophically applying bourbonism to progressive ideas as a solution. He was effectively triangulating. Woodrow Wilson was like Thomas Jefferson, who had adopted federalism under the guise of his own party's ideology. Woodrow Wilson had adopted the progressive idea through Democratic Party ideology and wrapped it in with their populist ideas and now there was nothing really in practice to debate much at all, which brings us to the decline of the fourth party system. Because Woodrow Wilson spends the end of his presidency, of course, focused on World War I, at which point his domestic policy dies. He doesn't focus on domestic issues at all. His progressive policy agenda is ended. He's focused now on the war. And then America enters or exits the end of the war. We're at the end of World War I, and the United States has emerged as a new great power. It's prosperous, it's thriving, the economy is working, and all these reforms have been put in place, and people are now pretty happy. The issues of 1896 have been put into the past. The country is thriving, and we go to this era we call the uh, Roaring Twenties. And it's a time of great prosperity, but also a time of political decline. Because now the parties don't really have much to fight about at all, there's a lot of drift, nothing's happening in Washington, corruption starts creeping in. All the things that we expect as a party system debate dies are now happening while the country is fat and happy and enjoying itself and is a rising new power. And then in 1929, the economy crashes. We have the Great Depression, the entire system falls apart, and we have the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. At which point, America is facing a new great debate, a new big problem, and the beginning of a new party system, the fifth party system, the one that we still live in today, the party system of conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats. Thanks a lot for watching and make sure you tune into the next episode because we're now at our own era, our own political age, the New Deal realignment that created the politics and parties that we now know, the liberals and conservatives and Democrats and Republicans of modern politics.